Today's opening segment is a very special one that I am directing specifically towards my younger brother, Andrew. Andrew is two and a half years younger than me. We grew up together and he's someone who I have immense respect for having seen everything that he's overcome in his life and where he is now married with his first child. I am now an uncle as of just very recently to Lincoln Kokesh, uh, not named after Lincoln Chafee, in case you were wondering. But uh, Andrew and my dad and myself and uh, our, our other siblings, uh, Alex and Alden and Audrey have been talking about the coronavirus crisis on WhatsApp. That's where we do our family chats. And we've got two different chats. We've got the, the kids one that my dad set up that's him and uh our stepmother uh, his third wife and the five of us kokesh kids and then there's the other one that's called pandemics and politics where where we discuss these things and I i've told the story about my father being vaguely conservative and you know the influence he had on me over the course of my life and and my brother and and my siblings of course all of us and uh he's he's still like it's my dad is definitely skeptical he's definitely on the skeptical like if this is if, if the coronaphobia crisis was a, a flash iq test and it was can you believe the right people can you see through the statistics do you know what a proper response is he passed i'm afraid my brother might have failed and that's why i'm talking to you andrew with this video in particular and my brother is, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, I, I want to separate to protect him and his professional considerations. Andrew is a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Washington state, and he works at an incredible clinic and he is a hundred percent. Actually, he's, he's on a, I think he's taking a kind of paternity leave. I don't know if technically that's what it is, but he's taking time off to be with his newborn. And, and that's great. But before that he was going to work. You know, and he was, and this is, this is like, you know, about the, you know, people who are actually being asked to step up in the coronavirus crisis, public mental health workers, people like my brother dealing with all of the crazy paranoia, all of the, you know, and, and dealing with people who are mentally fragile on a regular basis, being able to take care of them as he does is an essential service if there ever was one. And, and, you know, a hundred percent, he is. Uh, you know, uh, respecting their health guidelines, but even that's kind of like it's 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 kind of up in the air, from what I understand. And that you know that they're uh, you know they're they're my my, my brother uh, has a relatively small office where he meets with patients, where you know inevitably at some point you're going to be within six feet. I think they're doing temperature checks and and asking people to wear masks and and things like that. But even that even that is problematic. And I believe that, that Andrew, I believe you have fallen for the fear here. And I've been saying on this show that one of the greatest silver lining of the coronaphobia pandemic is that people like my father, people like our dad and me get to talk to people like you and Alex and Alden and Audrey who don't take the luxury that we do of reading the news between the headlines, looking into it and being skeptical. And I have been so encouraged by how much you guys have been engaging and looking at, at you know, me and dad going, no, this is a conspiracy. This is crazy. You know, and, and I, I hate to say that my dad still takes a bit of a conservative angle on this but he's definitely a skeptic he's definitely like you know he's he's in the vulnerable age bracket and as soon as he could in, in in his home state of wyoming where he was born and raised and now lives after having lived so many other places around the world in the country going out to restaurants with his wife not a problem um my sister audrey is a, a server in wyoming and has dealt with a lot of this herself as well and 
you know, Andrew, what we're seeing, I, I hope it's blatantly obvious now that we have been scared into giving up our rights. We have been scared into giving up our rights to work, to travel freely, to engage with other human beings, to be part of the big, rich, overflowing human Petri dish, and to decide our own level of risk. That is what has been taken away. And I hope you see this. I hope you learn from this now, having gone through this. And this, you know, maybe enough people have to go through this to get it. You know, and I got to be really humble here. It took me 10 years to go from identifying as a libertarian in high school just because I didn't want to be a damn Democrat or Republican to understanding what it meant. And in the meantime, I volunteered to join the Marines. I volunteered to go to Iraq. I, I, I was a part of the, the greatest evils of government. You know, <laughs> maybe it was that I had to experience that for myself. I had to go to war. I had to come home. I had to see the mainstream media contradicting what I had experienced firsthand in combat. I had to see the politicians line where I was uniquely qualified to prove that what they were saying was not true. Well, now we're, we're all going through this. All of us as Americans, we're all going through a similar experience where we are being put through a forced crisis based on lies. And I understand it's easy to get scared first. Yeah. If, uh, you know, a scam artist can scare you into cowering and and keep you coward long enough and not look up and realize that they're a scam artists, it's a lot easier for them to rip you off. And I understand, yes, you, there's a stimulus response, something scares you, but you can't just stay blind to what's happening. You cannot ignore now tens of millions of Americans. Every, everyone around the world is suffering. And it's not from the virus from the virus, which is real, yes, some people would be suffering. Why do we see widespread global suffering, not from the virus, but from the shutdown? In the United States, it's tens of millions of Americans unemployed because of a forced unemployment crisis. It's millions of American children going hungry tonight because their parents are struggling, not allowed to work. It's the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer at a faster rate than ever before in human history. Every one of these major government ripoffs from the 2008 crisis, the, the housing crisis, from you know, going back to the stock market crash, Black Friday, these, these engineered crises are designed to consolidate wealth and power and they get worse exponentially over time, every iteration. So to say this is the biggest ripoff in humanity isn't special. It's just, yeah, the, 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 the pattern is continuing. If they can get you to direct your attention to suffering at the expense of seeing the bigger picture of suffering, you can be misled. And that's what's happening. And Andrew, dare I say, you have been misled. Look at the attention that you are putting to the coronavirus when 22 veteran suicides a day, chronic heart disease, obesity, uh, you know, all, all the smoking, all these other things that you as a public health worker know are bigger threats. More people are going to die of those things because of the misdirection of resources. As a healthcare worker, Andrew, you have to be sympathetic to the other healthcare workers who are out of a job because they have been deemed non-essential elective surgeries being postponed, hospitals losing, having to lay off staff left and right. Like, are, are you, you have to see, like just out of compassion, please step back and see that more people are suffering because we have allowed our attention to be misdirected. We have allowed government to use this crisis as an excuse to violate individual rights, to rip us off, to, to add $9 trillion of liquidity to the market. I mean, do, do you even know what that means? I barely know what that means. I just, I, I, what I know for certain about what that means is that the dollars in your back pocket and your bank account lose value. 
people on fixed incomes lose purchasing power. Everybody else gets screwed while the people connected to this giant money found get rich and they benefit. The rest of us suffer. As Thomas Jefferson said, if we allow central banks to control the issuance of currency here, we will wake up homeless on the continent our forefathers conquered. That is what is happening right now. That is what has been happening for decades with the manipulation of the markets, with the manipulation of the fiat currency system. I mean, Andrew, you know, you, you bought you bought a home. Do you, do you really think that that was a fair transaction? Do you really think that was the best way for you to purchase a residence through the current banking system and mortgage, financial lending, really? No, and housing is, is still a huge bubble. And it's popping now, sort of, starting to pop perhaps, starting to, to, to get readjusted back to, to like appropriate levels. Housing has been way overinflated our entire lives. We have more empty homes than homeless people in this country. I, I, do you not see a problem with that? And now, now all of a sudden, because coronavirus is here, well, now we have to care about other people. Now, now we have to go above and beyond, and we have to wear masks out of consideration for other people, and we have to shut down the economy. To you never, with any of these other problems, would you have advocated something so desperate as this? There's so many other points that like in that in, the, in that rant. I'm like, oh, what? But Andrew, I need you to understand this. Andrew, we, ah, there, there's so many other. But the, the bottom line, what does nine trillion dollars of liquidity mean? The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And if you give into the fear, you're using that as an excuse. But I want to bring in, I want to, I want to tag team my brother on this one. So I'm going to turn to Dr. Ron Paul because Ron Paul was right. And now we see in, in a time where a lot of libertarians are falling for some of the sphere and confusion, perhaps listening to the great old doctor again will provide some much needed perspective. From the Ron Paul Institute, Ron Paul writes, listening to the coronavirus experts has led to death and despair. Who do we listen to? This is, this is what they, they don't teach logic and reasoning in government schools anymore. We would know what the appeal to authority means. Appeal to authority is simply, well, it must be true because an authority said it. We create authorities from public opinion, from majority votes. Trump is an authority because he's the president. You don't like him when well, we question him, but he gets to, to, to give Dr. Fauci a job and put him on the podium in front of everybody else. And you go, well, that's the authority. That's the expert. Why? Because Trump said so. Because God, no, oh, because you trust the government system. Because you trust the not ideally, even if it was the honest mob vote, but it's not. It's the manipulated mob vote from the duopoly. Like, real, like this is what you have to ask. Well, what is an expert? How how do we qualify someone as an expert? Who do we listen to? How do we know they're not corrupt? Just look at their history. On April 21st, the Washington Post savaged Georgia Governor Brian Kemp's decision to begin opening his state after locking down for weeks. Georgia leads the race to become America's number one death destination, sneered the headline. By the way, going back for a second, about looking who to trust, who's got the history, who's got the record. I, I'm so grateful to talk to you about what Dr. Ron Paul has written about this now because he has, for me, the stellar reputation of having been right and honest for decades of his public service. I hope now. What am I? Uh, 14 years into my life as a, a public figure, I, I hope that I'm establishing that same reputation of integrity, of, of, of you know, a, a kind of journalistic and, and activist and, and political integrity. The author, liberal pundit Dana Milbank, actually found the possibility of Georgians dying to be hilarious, suggesting that as a promotion, Georgia could offer ventilators to the first hundred hotel guests to register. Milbank, who is obviously still getting paid while millions are out of work, sees his job as pushing the mainstream narrative that we must remain in fear and never question what experts like Dr. Fauci tell us. Well, it's been three weeks since Milbank's attack on Georgia and its governor predicting widespread death, which he found humorous. His predictions are, are about as worthless as his character. Not only has Georgia not seen coronavirus burn through Georgia like nothing has since William Tecumseh Sherman, as Milbank laughed, but COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths have seen a steep decline 
since the governor began opening the state. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I, I would. I'm, I'm pouring myself a drink here. I wish. I wish I had it ready. Would, 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 would the, the Kermit the Frog sipping the iced tea? Yeah. yeah no. Mm. Cases went down where they opened up, but that's none of my business. I got. I got to sip really loud to make it be the effect, right? Truth tastes good, doesn't it? I'll do this again. But COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths have seen a steep decline since the governor began opening the state. Maybe getting out in the fresh air and sunshine should not have been prohibited in the first place. In fact, as we now have much more data, it has become increasing, becoming increasingly clear that the U.S. states and the countries that locked down the tightest also suffered the highest death rates. Ultra lockdown Italy suffered 495 COVID deaths per million, while relatively non lockdown South Korea suffered only five deaths per million. The same is true in the US, where non lockdown states like South Dakota were relatively untouched by the virus, while authoritarian led Michigan, New York, and California have been hardest hit. Now, I know my brother Andrew, Andrew, I know you're, you're hearing this and going, Okay, but that's a that's a correlation, not a causation. Yes, yeah, certainly deserves to be parsed out. Well, did they lock down because they were getting hit worse? No, you're going to see this in the statistics coming out much later. And I guarantee you, Ron Paul isn't just spouting off the top of his head. Trust me, he's considered these things before putting them in writing. In the sense that, look, South Korea, for example, uh, non-lockdown. South Korea, pretty dense population as well. So when you parse all of those possible conflating factors out, you will still find Ron Paul's point holds true. Surprise, surprise. Emergency orders with lockdowns is causing a, a massive stress hormone surge, causing anxiety in patients like yours, as you know, people with just run of the men, mill mental health issues now being isolated. Uh, and, and then there's the, the immunosuppressive effect of all of these things that lead to worse experiences with a flu like virus. Surprise, surprise. In those hardest hit states, we are now seeing that most of the deaths occurred in senior care facilities after the governor's ordered patients sick with COVID to leave the hospitals and return to their facilities. <coughs> there, they infected their fellow residents who are most likely to have multiple comorbidities in advanced age that turned the virus into a death sentence. Will these governors be made to answer for this callous disregard for life? And again, this is where freedom gives you a better answer that would have saved lives, Andrew. When we say let people respond and set their own levels of risk, what that means is that we would have had the capacity to support elderly care facilities taking appropriate precautions. When instead we trust government to do these things, well, these little mistakes are made without the possibility for correction. It's, hey, we're sending sick patients back into elderly care facilities rather than supporting them and directing resources to them to be able to quarantine and isolate and practice hygienic distancing better. Instead, we killed them. I hate to say we here because it's not accurate. Well, let's place responsibility where it is due. The responsibility for this lays on the governors, the, the, the president, the politicians who set these policies and denied people the freedom to set risk for themselves, to opt out of these coercive policies that actually got people killed. But Andrew, I dare say everybody who voted for them, this is where I want to say we, but I would not count myself in this we here. Everybody who voted for Republicans and Democrats that endorse this system, that say your rights don't matter, your freedom doesn't matter, we get to make health decisions for you, we get to make risk decisions for you. What you have done is not only given up your right as an individual, but you have helped the system take away other people's rights, and now people are dead as a result of this. Does that not bother you? How can you not, as, as just a, a caring, humane person, take a step back and go, wow, yeah, it sucks people died here, but there are way more people dying here. Let's, let's look at this objectively. And by the way, the people dying over here, let's take an honest look at why they died and not trust the experts that are officially sanctioned by the people who have a very severe conflict of interest.
in what's happening here. Yesterday, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar admitted the obvious. We were seeing that in places that are opening. We're not seeing this spike in cases. So why not open everything? Because these petty tyrants cannot stand the idea of losing the ability to push people around. Shutting the entire United States over a virus that looks to be less deadly than an average flu virus, particularly among those under 80 who are not already sick, has resulted in mass unemployment and economic destruction. More Americans may die from the wrong-headed efforts to fight the virus than from the virus itself. Now here, <laughs> I, I'm going to go, you know, one one step further than Dr. Paul. I mean, he says it's may okay, may, maybe he's right. Dr. Paul is going to say may die. You know what? I think it's pretty safe to say already more people will die from the economic, government induced consequences around coronavirus. I don't say around using coronavirus as the excuse. The more people will die. And I say this, this this is a little bit, maybe shooting from the hip, but just knowing some of the statistics about suicide, about poverty, homelessness, children going to bed hungry, all of the things that we see all already happening as a result of this. How many life-saving procedures delayed? You're going to see a spike, and this is, this is one of those things that you're not going to be able to tease out until the statistics from later, but you're going to see a spike of all sorts of other causes of death during this shutdown period. You're going to be able to see it on a chart. Boom, during this period, there's a surge in this. But then you're also going to see waves of consequences in health as well as the economics that is going to perpetuate. Our, these, the economic waves are going to perpetuate the health consequences of all of this. But even the, the economic consequences 10 to 12 years by by uh, the JP Morgan estimate of when, when we're going to get back to just employment recovery. I think we can do better than that. I'm a little more optimistic. But think of all the, all, all the health consequences, all the people for whom they, you know, getting out and walking was, was saving their lives on a daily basis, or at least, you know, how many people are just elderly people on the verge of heart attacks? on the verge of other degenerative diseases taking over. Now, you're staying at home. There's going to be a wave. There are going to be waves of health consequences that you're going to see in the statistics coming out after this. Divorces, suicides, heart attacks, uh, increases in obesity, right? People just, I mean, there's, going to, there's going to be a way, like I, even me, like Andrew, even me, I don't know about you, but uh, you, my brother and I are, are definitely fitness junkies. We always have been. Um, from when we were working out together with our, our rugby team in college and doing extra workouts, you know, sometimes just the two of us and sometimes just us and our friends. And like, even me, like, yeah, oh, hey, you can't go to the gym anymore. I'll like, and my routine was built around touring and going to Anytime Fitness. You know, every, every other day, every day, at least while we're on the road. And then boom, now you can't. It messed me up. And I'm strong. I'm healthy. I'm relatively young and fit. You have to you, we, we just question when government says the lockdowns are the answer. Who's going to suffer? Americans should pause and reflect on the lies they are being sold. Masks are just a form of psychological manipulation. Many reputable physicians and scientists have said they are worthless and potentially harmful. Now, I got a sidebar on this point from Dr. Paul because this is so important. Psychological manipulation. We haven't really talked about this too much, but I have mentioned, I think this is really an important part about what we're experiencing right now is that we are being led to be afraid of each other. I think the use of the term social distancing was actually deliberate because it is not accurate for even what they are talking about, which is better described as hygienic distancing or physical distancing, not social distancing. Why do they want you to be socially distant? Because they want you to stay at home. They want you to be isolated. They want you to be afraid. They want you to be weak. They want you to be easy to manipulate. And the thing about masks, to make you afraid of another human being's face in front of yours. 
I mean, what, what a trick. I mean, if, if before this, someone had said, we're going to make every American afraid to go outside, we're going to make them afraid to go near each other. You'd be like, no way. How are you going to pull that off? You go, oh, virus pandemic. Oh, you're going to scare the crap out of everybody with an, a funky off-season flu. It's less deadly than the flu. <laughs> it's less deadly than testifying against Hillary Clinton. Again, just a little humor in the perspective here. And Andrew, as a mental health provider, I really do look forward to hearing your observations on this and how things have changed. Not just right now, when everybody's scared, it's hard to even have perspective. How are things different now than when they were before? Until things calm down, we can say, how are things before? How are things in the middle of this? How are things now, later, as a result? It's going to be bad. It's already ugly. You just go to any grocery store. Even here in Chino Valley, Arizona, it's a, it's a dystopian scene. Now, as to the masks being worthless and harmful, yeah, there's a negligible benefit, perhaps. There's a reason they're a thing in you know the healthcare industry, but in terms of widespread use, <laughs> no. A nation of people who just do what they are told by the experts without question is a nation ripe for a descent into total tyranny. This is no empty warning. It's backed up by history. Time to stand up to all the petty tyrants from our hometowns to Washington, D.C. It is time to reclaim our freedom. And Andrew, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I hope you see this. I hope you take the time to really consider everything I've said in this half hour rant because this really is important to me. I'm doing this because I want to fight injustice. I want to alleviate the human suffering that results from that. I know that you want to also. Hopefully just giving you this little bit of background and perspective on my thoughts has helped you improve your worldview as well. Thank <laughs> you.